The Gospel of Mark has been called the Passion Story with a long introduction. In other words, Mark devotes a great deal of his Gospel to the last week of Jesus' life before his crucifixion. The same can be said of the other three Gospels as well. The focus of each of the Gospels and the focus of the Gospel of Jesus Christ is his betrayal, his arrest his trial, his crucifixion, his burial, and resurrection. As we come to Mark chapter 11, we enter that section that Mark has been leading us to. Things change as we come to chapter 11. David Garland wrote, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem marks the end of his avoiding crowds and his secrecy and the beginning of open confrontation with opponents in the temple. Alan Black wrote, The triumphal entry, as it has traditionally been called, is not named for Jesus' choice of mounts, which was a coat, probably a donkey, rather than a great steed. It is named for the processional of the many who held Jesus as he came down the Mount of Olives toward the Holy City. This event was a major turning point in that Jesus was publicly hailed with acclamation appropriate for the Messiah. Read with me from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a coat tied there which no one has ever ridden, untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a coat outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As he untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that coat? They answered, as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. It is most likely Sunday, the beginning of the week that will lead to the crucifixion of Jesus and the following Sunday, his resurrection. They are approaching Jerusalem. They come to Bethphage, and then Bethany as well. The Mount of Olives is a low mountain, elevation 2,500 feet, located east of Jerusalem. Bethany is said to be on the east side of that mountain, and Bethphage between Bethany and Jerusalem. But as you come to the Mount of Olives, and as you're at the top of this mountain, you have a good view of Jerusalem, which is also an, on an elevation. You would go down and then you would go back up to Jerusalem. This little detail is given. And we then have a very interesting little set of circumstances. I was telling Debbie that I remember this story from Mrs. Lee's stories about the Bible that was read to me over and over again as I was growing up. And so I went back and read it again last night, just for old time's sake. It's a much briefer account than I remembered. But Jesus says, okay, here is what I want you to do. You're going to go into the village. As you enter it, you'll find a coat tied there. Matthew says, the coat and basically the coat's mother. No one has ever ridden on this coat. Untie it and bring it here. 
If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? That's a very reasonable inquiry. Why are you untying that coat that doesn't belong to you? Tell them the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. Well, they do that. They do just as Jesus instructs them. They find the coat outside in the street, tied at a doorway. When they begin to untie it, some people are doing neighborhood watch, and they say, why are you untying that coat? And they answered, as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. They then brought the coat to Jesus. Have you ever wondered why the Gospels make such an issue of how the disciples got the coat Jesus rode when he entered Jerusalem? Now, Jesus gives explicit instructions. Go into the village, you'll find the coat there, and so forth. How did Jesus know there was going to be a coat there? Well, there are some who say, well, Jesus made prior arrangements. That is a possibility. We also know that Jesus was unique in that he had foreknowledge. He could miraculously know that all of this was going to happen. Mark and the other three Gospels do not tell us how Jesus knew it was going to be there, and so we're left to a little guesswork there. The important thing is that Jesus knew what he wanted. He knew the animal that he wanted for what was about to happen. As I said, Matthew mentions two animals. Likely, the mother was taken along to calm the coat. It had never been ridden. We're then told that everything happened just as Jesus had said. They found the coat, the bystanders. They asked what was going on. It was all explained. And then they bring the coat to Jesus. And as they do that, they throw their cloaks over it. And he sat on it. Then the procession begins into Jerusalem. People spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. <clears throat> Matthew explains that all this was in the fulfillment of prophecy. Why did Jesus pick the coat, most likely a donkey, why did things happen the way they did? What difference did it make how Jesus entered Jerusalem on this occasion? Well, the answer is found in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a coat the foal of a donkey. Zechariah's prophecy is about Israel's king and how he will enter the city. And now Jesus does just as Zechariah had said. And so Mark is very specific about the donkey and how the disciples got it. Mark does not want his readers to miss the point. Jesus, as humble as he is, is Israel's true king. In fact, if he hadn't been so humble, he couldn't have fulfilled Zechariah's prophecy. There is a difference in the way kings enter into the city. <clears throat> a very common thing would be for the king to ride on a great horse. He would ride in in victory. Along with them would be a procession of others, maybe others on horses. If a battle had been won, he would be trailed by the prisoners taken in the conflict. But if a king were to enter and was proclaiming peace, as is said in the Old Testament, he would ride in on a donkey. By entering Jerusalem in this manner, there is a direct fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And to make sure his readers don't miss the point, Matthew's account even quotes the prophecy. But Jesus orchestrates a grand entrance into Jerusalem that departs significantly from his previous patterns of movement in the Gospel of Mark. Up to this point, let's just kind of keep this low-key and quiet. 
Most of Jesus' ministry had been outside of Judea, certainly outside of Jerusalem. He's been out in Galilee for the most part. But now the time has come. And he comes to Jerusalem. And he comes into Jerusalem that day, that Sunday, in a grand way. And so we have the procession of his entry. And at least some of the people who were there don't miss the point. They spread their garments on the road in front of him. Others cut leafy branches and did the same. As far as I know, there is nowhere in Scripture that it talks about people waving palm branches <clears throat> as Jesus went along. No matter what people do on Palm Sunday today, I don't think they found that in the Gospels. But they prepare the way, and this is a treatment for a king entering. As they spread out the coats, as they spread out the branches on the ground, and as Jesus is coming in, riding in on that donkey, they shout, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna, in the highest. The word Hosanna means God saves. They recognize in Jesus something unique. They connect with him as being the expected Messiah. They connected Jesus with the coming kingdom of our father David. In other words, the messianic kingdom. According to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verse 39, when Jesus entered in this way, it was upsetting to the Pharisees. They told Jesus to rebuke those who were crying out this way. Jesus says even if these people were quiet, the stones would cry out. Why did the people say Hosanna? What does that mean anyway? Well, in Psalm 118, verse 25, we read, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. And the next verse says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so Hosanna is a combination of the two Hebrew words. Save us, we pray. And of course, that salvation could only come from God. We remember that in Zechariah chapter 9, the coming king is described as righteous and having salvation. So once again, Jesus is being held as Israel's king. As Jesus comes into Jerusalem that day, it's a celebration. It's hard to imagine how overjoyed they were. Now, at this point, the twelve, those closest to Jesus, those who've been with him now for about three years, they still do not comprehend the nature of the kingdom that Jesus is going to establish. They do not understand what kind of Messiah he is. And so, more than likely, most of the people who said Hosanna that day, who welcomed Jesus in Jerusalem, they didn't fully understand things either. They were certainly looking for a Messiah. They believed that Jesus was this Messiah, but they were still thinking earthly kingdom still thinking about the Messiah who would come and free them from the tyranny of Rome. Well, that's not what Jesus came to do. But Jesus was hailed as king, as Messiah as he entered the city. In less than a week, people would be shouting, crucify him. There would be a big change. Sometimes it's pointed out, well, you know, the people sure were fickle, weren't they? To praise Jesus on Sunday and to cry, crucify him just a few days later. People had inadequate understanding, including the twelve. And verse 11, I think, helps to explain how that change in mindset would take place. Jesus entered Jerusalem. The great procession leads him into the city. When he gets into the city, he goes to the temple. And he looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. He looks at the temple. 
Now, he's not a priest in the sense of the normal priesthood. He's not in the holy place, certainly not in the most holy place where only the high priest could enter. But he's there in the temple area, and he observes things. He enters the temple to inspect it. And the next day's events reveal that he comes not to restore the temple, but to pronounce God's judgment on it. In our next sermon, we will look at Jesus' cleansing of the temple. <clears throat> For the moment, the people are praising Jesus. Whether they fully understand things or not, they are rightfully praising Jesus as the expected Messiah. In fact, he will have to be crucified to be the Messiah that they need. Jesus goes out of town to Bethany with the twelve, spends the night there. I believe the record indicates that Jesus didn't spend the night in Jerusalem that week. Out in Bethany, he may have stayed with his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. <clears throat> Things are about to happen. Sometimes we have the anticipation of a great event. Preparations are made. The event happens. Things are really going to happen. As Jesus comes in Jerusalem, for this last time before his death. Earl McMillan observed, Jesus' action in the paragraph is therefore clearly messianic. Identified with a specific prophecy of the Old Testament and acted out literally with symbolic meaning. However feeble the faith, however inadequate the insight, something was realized and something was believed. The situation, strange, even inadequate, somehow projected Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus has come to Jerusalem. He has entered in a grand way, a way that attracts the attention of his critics, in a way that will contribute to his crucifixion. <clears throat> 